Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over Synopsis with Stuart Williams, who's going to talk today about the automotive design workflow. Stuart, the introduction of advanced node chips, as well as some of the older node chips, into the automotive design flow is much different than it was even a few years ago. We're now dealing with seven nanometer logic chips. These things have to work almost perfectly, and they have to work for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. What happens on the design flow for that? What changes? Yeah, really there's, um, there's a few trends that we're seeing in the automotive world today. Um, of course, uh, um, designs are being moved to ever smaller nodes. So as you mentioned, seven nanometer, even five nanometer and below are starting to come online. And so customers are wrestling with that. But one of the reasons they're moving there is because um, customers are trying to consolidate uh, or, and reduce the number of chips that they have in the car. For example, uh, they may go from dozens and dozens of chips doing different functions to just a small handful or maybe even one chip in the extreme case. And so this creates additional challenges. Um, you know, it accentuates the normal PPA challenges that they might expect. But of course, in order to satisfy the automotive requirements, uh, they also have to balance that against the ISO 26262 requirements. And these aren't simple chips, right? It's not the same type of one processor, one memory. These are lots of different accelerators and different processing elements on, this, on an SOC, right? That's right. Yeah, you have uh, accelerators, you have GPUs, you have CPUs, uh, large uh, amounts of memory to handle uh, these uh, complex, you know, to augment the CPUs to handle these large complex operations that need to happen. And many things happening in parallel as well. And you also have some fairly sophisticated cooling systems going on in these chips as well too, right? Yeah, they, absolutely. I mean, um, as these chips become larger and more complex, of course, they generate more power, right? And you have to bleed that off in some way. So I think automotive uh, manufacturers are trying to be more inventive about how they cool their chips. And at the same time, they're trying to, of course, reduce the power consumption of these chips. And that therein is the challenge, really. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. Stuart, what are we looking at here? Uh, sure. So we're really looking at an FMEA, FMEDA workflow. Um, that may be a typical workflow for an automotive SOC and its various components. Um, really, there are, we feel that there are, are of course, there are many challenges to, to designing automotive SOC, uh, but two of the major ones are how does a, um, how does a customer manage a complex FMEA, FMEDA workflow across multiple design teams, sometimes scattered across the world. Of course, you know, we talked about how some of these automotive SOCs are getting larger and larger, which means more design teams are involved and uh, that needs to scale. Uh, and the second is that, and that flow needs to be efficient as well. And the second is that when it comes time to implement, I mean, synthesis and place and route, implement uh, this SOC, uh, really it's a balance between the ISO 26262 safety requirements which naturally tend to increase power consumption or increase area, for example, with the natural tendency to uh, reduce PPA or you know, optimize PPA. So optim you know, improve performance, reduce power, reduce area as much as possible in the inevitable uh, face of the fact that these chips are going to consume more power and consume more area due to the safety requirements, typically. How many of these chips are custom designed versus designed for a socket? Um, well, um, it, it depends really on, on how the tier two is. It's usually tier two who's making or designing and making these chips, or designing these chips, I should say. Um, uh, often they will be what's called system element out of context, where um, they're designing for a certain target ASIL, for example, and then various tier ones or OEMs are consuming these chips and putting in their applications. Why don't you walk us through the flow you have? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so kind of the flow moves from left to right in this diagram. Um, basically, before I get into the details, let's, let's kind of talk at the high level. Um, uh, really, we're talking about, as we mentioned, FMEA and, and FMEDA workflow. And so coming into this flow, um, we have information like architectural information about the design, uh, design and technology information. Uh, for example, design information might be uh, how much area the various IPs can occupy. Technology data may be like fit rates and, and these kinds of metrics that are gonna be needed in, in this kind of FMEA, FMEDA stage. Uh, and then uh, FMEA and, and FMEDA is performed, and I'll talk about that in a second. And what comes out of this flow is, at the end of the day, the uh, design team has to prove that their automotive SOC is meeting the ISO 26262 uh, safety, functional safety requirements, uh, their target ASIL, 
And the Tarco ASOL has metrics like SPFM, single point fault metric, and LFM. And uh, FMEDA is designed to measure those metrics and report on them. Those numbers change, though. Uh, you think about uh, the ASOL D uh, temperature, the upper range of temperature has gone from 125 to 175 degrees. What has to, how do you keep track of that in this flow? Uh, that would be part of, for example, technology um, information that's coming in um, and is used throughout various portions of the design flow. Um, for example, during implementation, to take one example, uh, the PVK might be uh, rated for automotive grade temperatures to make sure that um, all the components can satisfy those temperature ranges. How about the rest of the flow here? Okay, sure, yeah, let me fill in a few of the details. So, if we uh, start here at the FMEA and FMEDA stage, the early stage, um, really, you know, design teams um, traditionally use manual methods to, to do their workflows, like Excel spreadsheets, for example. And this may work well in some cases, but as we mentioned, as these chips become more complex, as design teams become spread about around the world, um, those methods can sometimes be very cumbersome and, and may not be scalable. And so we have a, what we call a functional safety manager, and this is sort of a unified cockpit environment um, that allows these teams to interact with it, uh, do what-if analysis. It's very scalable in that uh, all the different teams who are contributing can provide their inputs. It can manage very large workflows, very large designs. And so this kind of forms um, sort of the, the management of this entire workflow, you could say, right? And the first part of that is FMEA, and failure modes and effects analysis. And this is a qualitative assessment. Um, it takes a look at potential failures, potential errors, et cetera. And in this process, the hardware functional safety mechanisms are identified. So we can start, say hardware functional safety mechanisms are identified here. And these are the mechanisms that ultimately are gonna be implemented in the design. And then once this portion is done, uh, early FMEVA can be performed. So FMEVA is a quantitative assessment, as we said before. Um, part of this input is what ASOL level the SOC must achieve. And in order to uh, demonstrate that it has achieved ASOL, FMEVA is run to output metrics like SPFM and LFM. So what makes this an early FMEVA is that uh, metrics like diagnostic coverage or the safeness of the design is input from maybe previous design experience or from guidelines provided by ISO 26262. And then you, the design team can say, okay, I, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna meet the target ASIL, right? And then at some, portion, at some part of the uh, design cycle, the RTL, of course, is being generated. And the RTL likely has uh, at least some, maybe the majority of these functional safety mechanisms already included in it. For example, uh, maybe ECC, might be there already, or for example, uh, dual core lockstep, DCLS, or maybe multiple cores, maybe more than just two in some cases. Um, so these are just some examples of the functional safety mechanisms already that may already be embedded in the RTL. Not everybody is fully versed in this flow though, right? You think about the tier twos, they have been developing mostly chips at much older process nodes than what you're talking about here. And the guys coming out of the, uh, the chip world, the electronics world, have never been dealing with the kind of reliability and safety restrictions that you have on these chips. Uh, that's true. I mean, um, uh, there are different types of customers, right? Um, th there are the customers who have done automotive design for a long time, and they've been slowly working their way down to the advanced nodes. Maybe they're at 16 today, and the next move is down to 7 nanometer. So they already have some idea of the challenges of FinFET design, and then that needs to be extended to 7, for example. Uh, then you have another class of customers who's never done automotive design ever before, and um, they don't know how to proceed, right? They need guidance. And a flow like this as, uh, uh, and, a, and a tool like the Functional Safety Manager can help um, articulate that flow and guide them through that, along with other guidance as well, of course. How realistic are the specs that are coming down from the OEMs on how long these chips are supposed to last, how well they're supposed to function over time versus what the reality is from what we've seen in even in the server world, where the chips are replaced every four years in bulk. Right. That is the, one of the main challenges, absolutely, is how do, you make, how do you design these chips so that they last for 15, 20 years reliably um, and are able to detect and control for random hardware failures as well, right? These are kind of the two main tasks, or two of the main tasks, I would say, in automotive SOC development. Um, it's, it, uh, part of that is through uh, quality mechanisms, um, 
implementing good quality control. Part of that is through making sure that you're meeting automotive grade temperature requirements. Um, part of that is making sure you're doing a good reliability analysis for your design. And in, in that sense, I mean uh, EM analysis, or if you're doing transistor level analog design and doing transistor level analysis, it could include device aging, for example. So these are different ways to try to uh, ensure that the chip will be defect free for up to 15 or 20 years. Where does circuit aging and device aging fit into this flow? Yeah, I mean, uh, typically um, uh, it fits into the analog kind of fault simulation component or anyway simulation component. So um, as, um, as the, uh, the analog circuitry is typically analyzed, of course, using SPI simulators down to the transistor level, and that's where uh, you're typically injecting device aging uh, analysis at that level. You've got a lot of pieces here, and sometimes in automotive those are moving pieces because algorithms change, functional safety uh, regulations change. Hmm. Is this modular enough to be able to incorporate changes and also the changes from the field that say, hey, this failed out there, we need to fix this? Yes, absolutely, it's a good question. Um, this uh, functional safety manager and the FMEA and FMEDA um, that is done as a part of that is hierarchical. So it takes a look at that uh, design in a hierarchical way. Uh, at the top level, it takes a look at all the different subcomponents of that, you know, down to the IP. And uh, that's at, it's at that level where faults and errors and et cetera are identified and the analysis is done. So if one subcomponent uh, uh, needs to change, that can be manipulated and then the entire flow can adjust accordingly. And that's really one of the powers of this functional safety manager is because it's structured in this way, as design requirements change or if they change, then it can be accommodated easily in this flow. One of the key elements here, of course, is functional safety. How does that go through this flow? Right. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, our focus right now in this particular discussion is largely around the functional safety implementation. And um, as we mentioned in, in, at the RTL, you know, typically some of these mechanisms are already there, like ECC or DCLS. Um, logic BIS is another um, important component typically used for automotive safety. And um, uh, this is... Uh, a, com a, a part, logic BIST and BIST in general is typically inserted at the gate level netlist side, traditionally, I would say. But there's a, we have a powerful capability to bring that into the RTL side. And we call that part of our shift left idea, where um, it bringing everything as far forward in the flow or shifting left, like in this diagram. And uh, generally, when you do that, you're able to improve PPA, you're able to um, smooth, uh, provide a smoother flow for the designers because more things are known up front instead of rather than later in the design flow. And so this is all, you know, this can be at the RTL level, as I mentioned. Uh, the second part is this X part, which means that uh, logic BIST is uh, tolerant of X states, which are unknown circuit states, essentially, um, uh, such as timing anomalies and whatnot. So instead of having to remove all those timing anomalies, the logic BIST can be tolerant of them. Uh, RTL can also be used in a kind of a fast static analysis um, this has major, two major components. One would be um, a kind of a hierarchical analysis of this design. Um, in order to do that, a, a quick synthesis is run in, in, inside this fast static analysis. And then um, uh, diagnostic coverage and other metrics can be computed hierarchically. Um, and then a, and the, and based on the results of that, um, if additional functional safety mechanisms need to be inserted at different parts, parts of the design that can be done. You know, or it could be a flag that maybe that needs to be done, for example. Um, so a second, uh, more fine-grained analysis can be um, to identify registers that are in the safety critical path. For example, that um, may need to have run redundancy inserted uh, to avoid uh, soft single event upsets. I'm sorry, single event upsets, SEUs, for example. And then we call them triple mode redundancy here. So this would be replacing one flop with three flops and uh, voting logic. What you've done here is narrow down where you need the redundancy. So one of the complaints initially was that everything would be redundant and that would take up way too much space, it would take up way too much power, and it would actually cost way too much. Right. But if you can actually narrow down what really needs to be redundant, that, com that sharply reduces the amount of redundancy that you need in the chip, right? That's correct, yeah. Uh, TMR is one example of that. Um, for example, you know, one approach is to, say, replace every register with the TMR approach. Well, of course, that would be prohibitive in terms of area and, and power and, and these kinds of things. Um, so in, in our approach, uh, during the, the fast static analysis, um, the registers are ordered in terms of their SPFM contribution. Uh, 
and then uh, some n number of those registers can be selected to replace with TMRs in your design. And this will ensure the optimum uh, compromise between uh, functional safety requirement as w and the PPA, the power area requirements, basically. So you move from there to implementation. That's right. So um, what comes out of all of this, you know, anal uh, all of this uh, injection of this and this analysis with TMRs is essentially, um, you know, basically are usually an RTL with the functional safety mechanisms inserted and then maybe some additional information about the, the registers for, to be replaced by TMRs. And now that needs to be implement, implemented. And historically what happens is that um, uh, the implementation tools are not really designed to handle these functional safety mechanisms because they have, uh, these mechanisms are not just a, oh, a dual core lock step mechanism, but they have physical separation requirements, for example. So if you have two cores, they might need to be separated by some distance and the routing needs to be handled appropriately. Maybe the clocks need to be handled as well. And that's all that information is, uh, or all that kind of uh, manipulation uh, implement is done here in the implementation stage. And so customers, because the implementation tools historically don't um, capture that information very well, maybe customers have to write scripts or do other manual methods to account for that. But uh, we have a, a new feature, a new set of features that we call FUSA. And um, the FUSA intent is specified here by the designer kind of at the beginning of the implementation phase. And that will contain physical information, like how far the cores need to be separated. Um, the same might be for the TMRs as well, et cetera. There's other information there as well. And then that functional safety intent is carried throughout the entire implementation, synthesis and place and route, um, until you hit the end so that you know that the, your chip that is placed and, route, placed and routed uh, has all these separation requirements and other features already in it. Given all the pieces that you have here and how complicated this flow is, is it adding time to what you would normally do for developing a chip because you do to have all these functional safety requirements? Generally, uh, designing an automotive SOC is a lot more intensive than designing an automotive SOC. Absolutely. And it's for exactly some of the same reasons that we're talking about here today. Uh, functional safety, reliability, you know, these kinds of requirements are exactly expanding that. And that is... Um, a very key consideration because, of course, the longer it takes and the more effort it takes to design a chip, the higher the cost of the chip, right? And the longer the lead time for development of that chip. And these flow, this flow, for example, is designed to try to minimize um, the time and the effort by automating this as much as possible. And this is just on the front end. That doesn't even take into account the manufacturing, the testing, the real-world testing that mm -hmm. goes on, the, the testing throughout its lifetime. All of that has to be factored into this too, right? Yeah, and, and um, this is what's pretty interesting. Actually, there is a linkage there with like LogicBist, for example. So LogicBist is a, a, one of the reasons it's important in automotive is um, uh, when the chip is manufactured and it's tested before it goes into a, a car, um, it has to uh, be tested to make sure that the manufacturing process produced the chip that, and that operates in the way it was intended to operate in, right? And typically that can be tested with BIST, LogicBist right there. And so you can automatically discard the parts that are defective and retain the parts that are not. And then those chips go in the car, and every time you turn on the car, or you turn off the car, or periodically during the operation of the car, these BIST mechanisms are triggered, and uh, they can test the various subcomponents and subsystems on the fly. Um, if a random hardware failure is encountered, is encountered while you're driving, um, the BIST can help to identify, was this a transient failure? Did it happen, and now it's no longer there? Or is that it ha the error happened one time, or the fault happened one time, and it still exists? Maybe that's a permanent random hardware fault, right? And the car can say, you know, pull over so we don't crash or something like that. that can, that's what, so these mechanisms can be tied to some degree to the manufacturing in the back end there. Yeah. Stuart Williams, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.